already Z80. In today's video, I'll be showing you how to create life on the Amstrad in yet another game of life. The game of life, also known as life, is a cellular automation devised by John Conway. It's basically a few simple rules which will keep cells alive or dead. And you can see by the Wikipedia page, you can create some interesting patterns. And I thought to myself, why not? Let's create one for the Amstrad. I've already created a version before on the single board computer with my Z80 using an 8x8 LED matrix. So I thought, let's give this a go. And my first attempt was uh, pretty ordinary. And this was my first go at it. And I just did it the wrong way, using the screen as a memory location to store all the cells, reading the screen. And it just took so, so long uh, refreshing. I thought it actually stalled. Let's uh, put this in turbo mode. And uh, as you can see, it's still just sitting there. And it takes about, I don't know, 20 seconds to actually update per move in turbo mode. Way too slow. So I had to think of a better option. And then just out of coincidence, I had a look at the CPC wiki and uh, someone posted this article. Comsoft 6128 uh, said they uh, created a version of the game of life, or at least uh, copied a version from an old uh, magazine, Amstrad uh, user issue 12. And like I said in the, t in the title, yet another game of life, because there's lots of different versions out here, and I'm just going to create another one, but it's actually really simple to do. As you can see, there's another version here with using green cells. An interesting version down here um, that someone posted in uh, BASIC and it uses a cross between BASIC and machine code. The machine code does kind of the cell updates and the BASIC does the editing editing and displaying. It actually looks really cool. It looks like this. And as you can see, I've set up a, a few uh, cell um, formations here. A couple are just repeating and one's um, going back and forth and creating gliders. As you can see, it's not that difficult to create life on the Amstrad CPC. As my version was extremely slow, I thought I might have a look at the code, uh, how this uh, version was created. Came out of uh, this uh, magazine here, and you can see a bit of source code there, a bit of uh, machine code, and I actually keyed all this in, which is, uh, took a bit of time, but uh, got it going. And surprisingly, it was actually quite similar to what I've done in the past. But one interesting thing that came out of my little research here was this, in the same magazine, I found this bit of code. And it talks about screen manipulation and how we can create uh, games or animations that are really fast to the screen. And in the previous video, I talked about uh, this method here. So it was a really good uh, fact-finding learning mission from my side. You can see like the screen layout. It talks about how the screen is laid out and it gives you some sample code which you can uh, uh, work your way up from uh, from a slow version to uh, you know the fastest version or the fast screen update version. So I found that really useful. And I did say yet another Conway's game of life because as you can see, there's a, already a few versions out there. But you know this game is something really easy to create in a in Z80 assembler, and uh, it actually creates uh, life to your computer and you know all sorts of amazing patterns can come out of uh, just a simple random generation of uh, cells. So let's have a look now at, at how the Game of Life is structured and how I'm going to build this application. The Game of Life has really only three rules and it's regarding a particular cell. So the cell looks at all its neighbours and there are eight neighbours. There's three above it, three below and one left and one right. So all the neighbours around the cell and based on the number of cells that are alive or dead around it, we'll, we'll work out whether that cell stays alive or dies. Any live cell with two or three live neighbors always survives. There's just enough there to keep it going. Any dead cell with three live neighbors around becomes a live cell, so the three cells actually create life. And all other live cells die in the next generation, so if there's more cells around it or less cells around, it's too many, it's overcrowded, or uh, not enough to keep life going, they die, and any other dead cells stay dead. Here are some examples. 
So we have one cell in the middle. Is this one going to be alive or dead after the next round of cell generation? Two cells around it. So two cells keep it alive. What about three cells around the center cell? Three cells. Yes, that will also keep alive. What about only one cell around the center cell? Not enough there to keep life going. So we'll destroy that cell. And what about five cells around it? Well, that's way too much. It's overcrowded. So this cell will be destroyed. And lastly, what about if there are no cells active in the middle, but there's three around it, an empty, a dead cell? Well, that actually creates life. So we'll actually create a new cell out of that. So how am I going to code this? Well, we need to look at each cell in in turn, but we don't want to overwrite the current cell in the current memory location and say, okay, we've found three live cells around it, we'll keep it alive. Because that will lead to actually interfere with the next cell next to it. We'll need to sort of do our cell lookup, put them into some temporary location, and then put them back into the live memory. So for this example here, we have this live memory location and a temp memory location. We're going to apply the Conway rules to the current live memory location and write it to a temp memory location. And you can see the cell combination on the left matches the cell combination on the right after we've applied the Conway's rules. Once that's all been done, we're going to then copy the temp memory back into the live memory. So we'll wipe out the live memory and just replace it with the temp memory. The temp one becomes a live memory. And now we've got the next round of cells, or the next life cycle. We're then just going to print them to the screen. So display the cell memory location to the screen in some pictorial or some sort of format so we can represent, you know, see the cells as they are instead of just numbers in memory. How am I actually going to do this in memory? Like, am I going to use numbers or what numbers am I going to use? And I know this slide's a bit overwhelming at the start, but let's have a look you know, because we're going to run into a particular issue, as, you'll, as we'll see, in terms of looking at the cells or the surrounding cells. So this is how I'm going to structure the memory locations. So I'm going to have a, a top buffer and a bottom buffer of just dead cells. And I'm also going to have one column of cells I've just chosen on the left-hand side as also always dead. So we're going to have a, a dead buffer area and an active area. In this case here, I've got like seven across and seven down as active. In the real game, we'll be a lot bigger. I'm going to represent a live cell as by being non-zero, in this case one, and you'll see why one is, is uh, important or, it, or having it as one instead of like FF or O5 is, it will be uh, useful and a dead cell will be zero. One of the issues we arise is what about the top left-hand corner? Because are we going to limit the way we see the memory so if it's on the top left hand corner don't look up ignore that now in z80 coding i mean this is going to be complicated in, in if it's programming in c let's say it's easy just say you know if upper bound is reach and this all this and ignore that cell but to do that in in assembly is quite difficult it just requires a lot of jumps and it's very messy so it's much easier to create a, a buffer above and below so for instance the top left hand cell here uh, we'll look at its neighbors above and below and left and right, and it will actually enter the dead buffer area and not include it. And what we're going to do, we're just going to add up all the numbers around. So in this case here, you know, there's two live cells I can see, 01 and 01. So there will be two live cells in, you know, for, for our total for that, for that cell count. What about the right hand side? Well, that will actually go into, you know, the, you know, 0108 memory location, wrap around and it will reuse the column buffer on the left-hand side. Bottom left-hand corner also works well, and the bottom right-hand corner works well also, but we are going to include one extra cell that will also accommodate the bottom right-hand corner. So what's an easy way to add up numbers, you know, using, you know, looking above, looking below, looking left, looking right, adding them up? Well, the Z80 assembler has an index register, IX and IY, and we'll be using that. So for instance, if we're looking at position of the cell in position 0109, which is the top left-hand corner cell, what we need to do is look at the top left-hand cell, which is actually how many cells back is that in this example. So it's nine cells back. The IX register has, uh, has a second parameter, which is the offset. 
you can um, add or minus. One of the issues on Z80 is how do you represent minus numbers? And to simply put it, if let's say we're adding a number, you know, from zero, we add one, two, three, but if we're subtracting and we go from three, two, one, and zero, where does it go after zero? Well, it actually just wraps around to FF255. If you think about that, if we're taking one from zero and it goes to FF, well, minus one is FF, minus two is FE, minus three, FD, and so on. So minus nine will be F7. So if we plus F7, which sounds a bit weird, we're actually minusing nine. Plus F8, minus eight, plus F9 is minus seven, and plus FF is minus one. Now, Retro Virtual Machine, the assembler there doesn't allow you to say IX minus nine. Some compilers do that, but not Retro Virtual Machine. So the end result after after adding all these numbers together, we get the total cell count. So A will store the total cell count. Okay, let's start coding this. Usually how I code is by doing little increments at a time. So in this run through here of the code, I'm just gonna do some small increments, see how it goes, compile it, get it running, make sure it's working, and do step-by-step -step incrementations of the code. And if you look at the previous video on Retro Virtual Machine, It'll give you a good understanding of how to compile this program on Retro Virtual Machine and also some insights in screen manipulation and firmware calls. All right, the first thing we're going to do is set a location about where we're going to start. Now, this location here in memory is 40,000. Yeah, a nice little location to start at. So, 09, sorry, 9C40 is at 40,000 in memory on the Amstrad. Next, we'll just set up some constants. See, these are just firmware calls. The first one sets the mode of the screen, mode one, two, or three. We'll set mode. And uh, the second one just does a keyboard read. I'm gonna use a keyboard read here to just reset the uh, screen, you know, create new random, random characters, and also exit the application. We also need our primary screen location. So by default, Amstrad sets it up in memory location. C000. Next, we're just going to set a constant for escape. Now, for whatever reason, escape on my keyboard is FC. Not sure why, but that's what I'm using, and it exits out of the program. And we're going to just use the normal mode one screen. So it's 25 rows down, 40 columns across. We need some memory locations to store the cell data, and I've just chosen 8000 8, in hex. Now, if you remember, we're going to use a top buffer and bottom buffer. The actual start of the location of the active cells is one full row down, which is all the columns, plus two, because we also got that left-hand side empty buffer as well. And we also need that next space location or the temporary memory location as well, where we're going to copy the, you know, the active cells across based on the rules and then copy them back to the current base. So it's just the same location. And I've just used, uh, based on the number of cells we need, we need about 450 or so hex. So I've just added 500 hex just to, to be safe that we're clear of that, of the previous cells. All right, so let's create a start label. I like to just use start as my starting location. We'll just do some initializing at the moment. We're just going to set the mode to mode number one. Again, calling the firmware call here, setting A as 01, set to mode. Next. We need to initialize the, uh, the, you know, the memory locations with all dead cells or all zeros. Now this is a little trick to, to initialize multiple cells in, you know, essentially one go. You just set uh, where you want to start at because the HL is the current base and the next location, DE, the destination. We reset X or A, which sets A to zero. And then we save A into HL, the current base. We're going to, do this 454 hex times, which is uh, the you know the, the rows and columns plus, which is about a thousand, so 25 times 40, a thousand plus the top and bottom buffer and the left hand side column buffer, and we're going to use the load dir function that will copy hl to de bc times, and likewise for the next base location or the temporary location, we'll just reset it to zero. Probably not overly necessary, but we need those top and bottom buffers to be zero because we are going to copy everything through to from the current base to the next base. The next thing we need to do is to load some random data. 
So I've just chosen to load random cells in any location, called in a random function, just fill out the memory with ones and zeros, alive or dead. And to visually see this, I'd like to also just, you know, use the keyboard command to reset the random location. Let's just add some keyboard instructions. So we'll just call the key read. Now the key read method returns no carry if, or sets, sets carry, I should say, if a key has been pressed and no carry if it hasn't. So if nothing's been pressed, we just repeat the, you know, we'll just repeat what we're doing, displaying or, or updating the Conway rules. But if a key has been pressed, I think we should uh, load the, a new random location of cells or a new, new random number of cells. Let's uh, set that up. Let's have a, a, a tag or a label called life and jump with no carry to life. So no key has been pressed. Otherwise, a key has been pressed. Let's say for now, we want to be able to es escape as well. So if we press the escape key, then we exit the program or we load a new random number up. So what we should do now is check for maybe escape because we want to be able to exit the program cleanly. And if escape hasn't been pressed, but another key has been pressed, let's just load some more random data to the memory location. So we compare escape and jump relative. If, um, if it's on zero, so it hasn't been pressed, then uh, we should just go back to uh, loading random. So just call it new cells. We put up a tag here or a label, new cells. And otherwise return. Return is always called at the end of your program to exit back to the, the basic prompt. All right, the last thing we need to do is uh, load some random cells. So let's uh, create a label, load random. So what we want to do here is just iterate through the rows and columns and randomly fill them out with either ones or zeros. One's alive, zero is dead. So we want to point to the, you know, the location we're going to write to, the start location and number of rows. And we'll just do some nested loops here, rows and columns. We can set up a label R0. All right, we'll just save the rows and then we'll write the columns. I use, I like to use the B register because you can use DJ and Z. It makes it easier to, uh, to decrease B and then jump back if it's non-zero. More label. So I have a basic random function, a basic language, a simple random function, let's call it rand, which generates, uh, basically sets the carry if it's true, sets a you know, not carry if it's false, or, or vice versa, and we'll just use the carry flag because we want yes or no, we don't want a particular number. Call rand, which we'll create next. So by default, I'll uh, just load A with, with um, true, like a cell, a live cell. And if carry is set, so that's good, we'll, we'll store the cell. But if it's not set, then we'll just wipe it out to zero. A quick way to do it is X or A, and then uh, we'll store cell. So we'll just store it into HL, which is the current location. So load HL. Load A into the address located at HL. Or the memory location will increase HL to the next location. And we'll, uh, we'll do the next uh, row across. So DJ and Z and back to R1. Sorry, do the next column across. Once all the columns are done, what we want to do is uh, we need to increment HL one more time because we've got that extra blank column on the left hand side. So increment HL again. We'll restore the value of the, the, the row count and decrease that row count. And go back to R0. And that's it. That's our random function. The last thing we need to do is implement the rand method. So this is, I'm just going to cut and paste this. This is just a nice random, pseudo random function or method that I found that which seems to work well for what I need. So rand here and that's the uh, random method. It uses R here, the register R to get some, you know, pseudo random number and then manipulates it and eventually return, you know, uh, rotated by right one to set the carry flag either true or false, depending on the first or bit zero set.
Okay, now that's done, we'll save it and let's load this up into Retro Virtual Machine. I've uh, set up the Retro Virtual Machine to just display the terminal and also memory location and also the actual machine itself. I've already changed directory into the location where the code is. You need to look at my previous video to, to uh, get a better understanding about how to use Retro Virtual Machine. LS in my screen and Game of Life. I have got other bit of code there. We'll look at them later. Game of Life. So let's assemble this. ASM Game of Life. And there's an error. Load random. Let's go back to the code. Have a look what's going on there. Okay, well I discovered I saved the file in a different location. So let's do this again. So let's assemble it. And it works this time. And it loaded into memory location, 84 bytes. Let's run the program. We're not going to see much on the screen, but we should see the memory locations updating. So I'll go to the memory location, 8000. Okay, and uh, let's run the program. And hopefully uh, data will be filled out. Call 40,000. And we've got some ones and zeros there, which is pretty good. I'll press uh, a key. And you can see it updates. So I'm pretty happy with that uh, random generation of numbers. Press the escape key and it goes back to the prompt. Great. Let's continue. So what we need to do now, yes, we can see the memory changing, but let's look at it on the screen. Let's display that bit of information back to the screen, get some visual representation of what's going on. In the main life routine, we'll add display cells. Now the display cells method is talked about in my previous video. It's the fast screen update where it goes through every pixel on the screen and updates you know, that screen. Now what we want in this location, in this particular instance is if there's a one or a zero in that location, update either to you know a cell picture or a blank if it's dead. I am gonna quickly go through this. I have gone through it in detail in my previous video. Basically, I'm gonna draw an eight by eight pixel onto the screen you know, for a, for a live cell. And based on the, on the screen uh, layouts and, and screen memory locations of the Amstrad, it's somewhat confusing, but I use methods to, to manipulate that. So let's write the label display cells. Again, we just wanna save the screen location into HL, where we're gonna to write to. We're gonna get our data from our current start location, our live cell memory location, and and go through all the rows and the columns. So just another less nested loop of rows and columns. We're just gonna save the, the rows, save the current screen location. So we're gonna reuse HL and have the columns set as V. So now we need to uh, look at the current cell location, check if it's alive, check if it's dead. By default, I'll load as, as alive and I check A, so all A, that will set the flag to uh, the non-zero flag to zero or non-zero if it's uh, zero or not. And if it is zero, it's alive. Oh, sorry, if it's non-zero, it is alive, so we just plot it. Otherwise, we set DE to dead. Now, alive and dead, what are they? So let's go to the bottom and fill them out. So alive is this combination of bits. This is just basically uh, a square cell shape. Again, look at the previous video to understand how this works. And a dead cell is just this, just all zeros, just using uh, the background or border color, which is by default blue. So now let's do plot. So we know if it's, a, if it's alive or dead. Again, this is explained in my previous video, but basically we've got two pixels or two bytes across, eight bytes down per pixel. Uh, it creates an 8x8, we're going to plot it, and then we're just going to move, move the HL and DE data across to get the next bit of information and next screen location or next pixel location. And lastly, plot, which just uh, draws the pixel to the screen. We're going to corrupt uh, BC and HL, so let's save them, make another label, do row. And this just uh, draws that 8x8 pixel to the screen loading uh, the pixel byte reference, putting into the screen, and then incrementing the rows and columns. 
So now that should uh, display everything onto the screen. Let's uh, save this and uh, load this into uh, Retro Virtual Machine. Okay, and uh, compile it. Great, that worked. Now let's load it up. Okay, well, it uh, looks pretty good actually. The random cells, the one is on and uh, zero is off or dead. And if I press space, should uh, refresh and load a new random combination. So this is pretty much the hardest bit of the program. The easiest bit is actually to do the Conway rules. Let's just do them now. So the Conway rules are separated into three sections. We're basically going to look at one cell and look all around it. Add up all the ones and zeros, the live or the dead cells. Once we've got that total, then we're going to work out are we going to keep it alive or kill it or create a new life. And lastly, when we have that information, we're going to save it to the temporary location. Once all the cells have been counted for or looked at, the rows and columns, we're going to then copy the temporary memory location back to the live cell location and then redo the loop again to redisplay the screen. And that should get this uh, program up and running. So let's uh, call Conway. We'll create a, a label Conway. Again, another row, column, nested for loop where we need to look at every cell in the memory location, go across and go downwards. So we're going to use the IX register for the uh, current uh, cell locations. And IX using the index register will make it much more easy to look at up and down, below, left and right cell locations just by using indexing. HL will be the, the temporary location. And we've got B rows, now our nested for loop. Just going to push BC to save it. And we're going to load B with the columns. And you All right, so the first thing we do is we uh, get A and we check the cells above, below, left and right, all around using the index register. All right, so the first one is load A, so that wiped whatever A was previously. Top left-hand corner. Now, in this, again, my example, it was, it was only like a seven by seven grid. This is much bigger, so I go 214 back. Now that's, again, it's minus. So 214 in decimal is minus 42, and 215 is minus 41, and 216 minus 40. Then we get minus FF, or 255, which is minus one. Once we have the total count around all the cells, we'll now look at that figure and see if we're going to keep it alive or dead. So evaluate, apply the rules. So there's a number of ways we can do this. Um, this is the way I've just done it. I look at uh, D, I use D as you know, the live cell or the cell that we're going to be using. So I default to a live. I compare A to three. Is there three, are there three cells around it? Because if it's dead and it's three cells, we'll create uh, a live cell. So we're just going to store it in C. So I'll add that store C label. And then by default, now I'm going to set it to dead and compare two. Now if it's non-zero, which means that uh, it isn't just two, something else, and it's not obviously not three, then we're going to keep it dead. But if it is two, we're just going to check if it's alive or dead. So we're going to look at the current cell and we're going to just going to end it with one. Now what that does, that will, that will keep it alive or keep it dead. And then we're going to store whatever is in A. So it's the new cell, whether it's alive or dead, back into D. Now we're going to put D into the memory location, into the, into the temporary memory location. So load D into A, load it into the, the, the new cell or the next generation or the next life cycle of cells into HL, which is our temporary cell location. We're going to increment HL, we're going to increment IX. So look at the, new, the next cell across. And we're going to do the next column. Once that's done, we're going to skip over the, the blank column. We're going to restore our rows and do our new row. So once we exit out of these two routines, we'll 
have updated all the cells. All we need to do now is to copy the, the temp cell location back to the main location. And that's simply by doing an LDIR command. We want the next start, which is the temp location, back to the current location and 400 bytes worth of data to be copied. And that should be it. We should now see life forming on our Amstrad. So let's save that. Go back to our code. Okay, recompile it. Yes, it's worked. And let's give it a run. I'll just clear the screen. Call 40,000. And there we have it. So it looks like it's working. You know, it might not be working properly, but let's have a look. That looks really good. Press space should create a new set of random cells. And that looks great. Do you know what? I'm not 100% happy with this. There's still a screen update which is refreshing from top left hand corner down to the bottom right hand corner. And you can slowly see it, especially when there's a lot more cells. You can kind of see it scrolling downwards. I reckon I can do better and use. A technique called double buffering to make the animation seamless with no delay and I can do this really simply with not much change to the code so by default the screen location is C000 but where does it get that from it gets it from the CRT controller and one of the registers in particular register 12 so if we can change the start location to somewhere else in memory then we can swap between you know the the default location which is C000 to somewhere else. A good location is 4000. Now I won't go into the, the details of, of um, the, you know, the particular register but all we need to, to know is that register 12 is the one we're looking at, 30 is C000 and 10 in hex is 4000. So let's load something into 4000. I've got a cat, I've got a screen file First, I have to set memory to base location, this one be below 4000, and then load screen, SCR, at location 4000. Now, you won't see anything loading to the screen yet, but if I change the register 12 to 10, it should come up on the screen. There it is. We're going about the colors. If I go back to 30, it goes back to the C00 location. So the plan is to draw to the screen in the background, and then once it's completed, then display the screen. And that should create super fast screen updates. So we just need to add some uh, screen manipulation constants here. The screen uh, pointer, this is the uh, the CRT register 12, 30, we can, we can swap it by XORing it with 20 and we can also change C00 to 4000 by XORing with bit number 7 or the, the, the highest bit which is 80. What we need to do is change this life uh, procedure or the, the main routine to uh, swap the screen so point to a different buffer and then we're going to display the current buffer. We're going to update the rules. But before updating the rules, we would uh, swap the screen pointer and then update the rules. So at one moment, we're writing to a buffer that we can't see. Once it's written to, we're going to then view it. Because we're swapping the screens around from 4000 to C0, when we exit, we don't want to, want to exit on the 4000 screen. We want to swap back. Otherwise, we won't be able to see the, the cursor. So we're just checking before we exit what screen we're looking at and we swap it if we need to. 
Now we need to also remember what screen we're looking at and what's the state of the register 12 in the CRT. So down the bottom, I'll add just a couple more locations to save the current screen we're pointing to and the CRT pointer. Okay, in display cells, instead of pointing to the screen, we need to point to you know, the current screen we're going to be looking at, not just C00 because we are going to be swapping around. So we'll convert that to current buff. And now we just need to create our swap functions. So all we need to do is change the first two, uh, it's a 16 um, bit or two byte register, the screen C0, so just the leading two bits. So we get the bits, we uh, XOR it, and we save it back again. And swap screen pointer is slightly more involved. We still do the swapping and the XORing, so we swap from 10 to 30 in hex. But we also need to update the CRT controller. And a way to do that, basically we need to output to a port. We need to first say which register we're going to be looking at, and then we're going to update it. So the first call here is to say we're going to look at register 12, is OC, and then we're going to write A out to register 12. And that's it. Let's save it and give it a run. So compile it. That worked. And let's run it. And there you have it. A nice, quick, fast update of the cells with no flickering or delay of the refresh. That looks really good. Now let's just watch the Antrade come to life. make some more improvements to this bit of code you can uh, include, a, include a counter that will increment as uh, as each life cycle occurs you can also create an editor where you can place your own cells for, for a, your own defined starting location well I hope you enjoyed this video it's a really easy program to create and it looks really good it just does its own thing totally random looks really cool like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.